Imagine this, you just ordered yourself a brand new computer from an e-commerce store. But instead of receiving a small box on your doorstep from Lazada or Shopee, you have a delivery truck full of boxes to deliver. And not only that, but there's also a bunch of support technicians walking into your house. From what they said, it sounds like they'll be there for a few weeks to get this new computer of yours up and running. Well, this might seem crazy by today's standards, it's exactly what the process for setting up a computer in the 1940s. And good luck fitting those things in your home. Computers in the 1940s often took up an entire room, weighed many tons, and required constant air cooling to keep all of their vacuum tubes working. Point being, the small computers that we know today, and even your cell phones, the ones that we can slip into our backpacks or feel in our pockets or strap onto our wrist are just a shadow of the beast from yesterday. And this entire miniaturization process that we're all reaping the rewards from would have never been possible without semiconductors. In the previous video, we have discussed about electron theory and its relation to electronics. In today's session, we will talk about semiconductors. Hi, I'm Errol. Welcome to the Errol Electronics series where we explore the world of electronics from the ground up. In this lesson, the learner shall be able to explain how semiconductors are being utilized. Define the term semiconductor. Differentiate a semiconductor from a conductor and an insulator in terms of its properties. And lastly, explain the types of semiconductors. Without further ado, let's start. This was a roadmap for Module 1. Now, let's dive into semiconductors. Here we will discuss how semiconductors are being utilized, what semiconductors are, and its properties. Along the discussion of the properties of semiconductors, we will be comparing it to insulators and conductors in order to highlight its significant difference which led to its wide acceptance in electronics. And lastly, we will discuss the different types of semiconductors. Let's start with how semiconductors are being utilized. Shown here are four examples of how semiconductors are being utilized nowadays, particularly in the entertainment, healthcare, telecommunications, and transportation industries. The thing is, semiconductor utilization in these industries are often easily taken for granted. After all, when we buy these electronic items, all we ask the sales agent is whether they have the Model S car, a 50-inch TV, or a 4G smartphone. We rarely think about the fact that underneath the hood of that car, the panel of that television, and the casing of that smartphone are the electronic components made of semiconductors. Basically, anything that is computerized or associated to communication circuits utilize semiconductors. Since computers and communications devices are also needed in maritime vessels, various electronic devices are now installed on board modern ships. These include an autopilot system, also known as a self-steering system, which coordinates data from many devices on the ship to keep the vessel on a predetermined course. Another electronic device is the gyro compass, which locates the correct north direction and is unaffected by external magnetic field. Next is a radar, which detects targets and displays the information on the screen to avoid collision. And a chart plotter, which combines GPS data with an electronic navigational chart to display the position, heading, and speed of a vessel. All of these electronic devices are found on the deck department. For the purposes of the engine department, 
and this basic electronics force, ships also utilize several power supplies. But this picture of a power supply may not be familiar to you. So let's change it to something that is common. A cell phone charger. This charger is actually a direct current power supply. We will be dissecting and learning about the various sections of a DC power supply as part of this series. By the way, subscribe to this channel if you are not yet subscribed and ring the notification bell so that you will be updated on our latest uploads. If this video has been helpful, please leave it a thumbs up to help it reach its intended audience. Now that we have established how semiconductors are utilized in electronic devices, let's now move on to what semiconductors are. According to Malvino and Bates, a semiconductor has an electrical property that is between a conductor and an insulator. On another note, Boylestad and Nashalski defined a semiconductor as a material with a conductivity level between a conductor and an insulator. Both these authors of electronics book support what we have learned in the previous video about the property of a semiconductor which is on valence electrons. So, let's review. We learned that the number of valence electrons will tell us what the electrical property of an element is. Less than 4 valence electrons means it is a conductor. Greater than 4 means it is an insulator. And lastly, if it has 4 valence electrons, it is a semiconductor. Now, shown here are the various planetary model or orbital diagram representation of the electrons of each given element. We have here silver, aluminum, gold, nitrogen, neon, sulfur, silicon, germanium, and carbon. Now, if we focus our attention on the valence orbit, it is clear that silver, aluminum, and gold are conductors with silver and gold having one valence electron and aluminum having three valence electrons. That is why a computer's processing unit or CPU utilizes golden pins since gold is a better conductor of electricity than copper. We can also conclude that nitrogen, neon, and sulfur are insulators since the number of valence electrons is greater than 4. These elements are actually considered non-metals. That is why it is a bad conductor of electricity. Finally, we have silicon, germanium, and carbon as semiconductors. There is actually a shortcut in determining the number of valence electrons, and we will be using the periodic table. Shown here is the periodic table. Before I discuss the shortcut, I'll give a disclaimer first. The shortcut that we will be discussing is only applicable to these elements. In other words, these elements here, called the transition metals, is an exception to this shortcut, since finding the number of valence electrons for these elements needs a thorough understanding of the electron configuration which we will no longer tackle in this course. By just looking at the group name or the column name, we will be able to tell how many valence electrons an element has. If it is in group 1A, it has one valence electron. If it is in group 2A, two valence electrons, so on and so forth. Notice that carbon, silicon, and germanium belong to group 4A. As such, we can tell that it has four valence electrons. Nitrogen has six valence electrons. Neon has eight valence electrons. And sulfur has six valence electrons. The next property of a semiconductor that needs to be explained is the energy band. Before we explain the energy band model, We'll start with something that we are already familiar with. Here, we have the nucleus, the valence orbit, and the valence electron. 
Now, another characteristic of subatomic particles is the attraction of the electrons to the nucleus since opposite charges attract the protons in the nucleus being positively charged while electrons being negatively charged. But due to the centrifugal force created by the orbiting electrons, they remain stable in their respective orbits, much like satellites orbiting the Earth. Due to the distance of the valence electron from the nucleus, its attraction to the protons at the center is weaker. Remember that the valence electrons are found on the outermost orbit. In other words, the larger the orbit of an electron, the weaker is its attraction to the nucleus. When a valence electron gains enough energy due to, for example, a rise in temperature, it has a tendency to leave its parent atom and become a free electron, leaving behind a vacant hole in the valence orbit. To better explain this phenomenon, we use the band model. In this model, the vertical axis represents the energy level of an electron. And instead of a valence orbit, we have a valence band where the valence electrons are located. This model also has a conduction band where free electrons are located. And in between the valence and conduction bands, there is a band gap, also known as the forbidden energy band. As you may observe, there are no free electrons in the conduction band at the moment because this is the band model for an insulator. Shown here are the band models for a semiconductor and a conductor. If we look into the band model for a conductor, we will observe that the valence and conduction bands overlap. This means that at a certain energy level, in this case this line over here, we can call the valence electron also as a free electron. In other words, the two terms, free electron and valence electron, becomes interchangeable. It is different for semiconductors and insulators because there is a forbidden energy band or band gap that must be crossed first before the valence electron becomes a free electron. We can think of the forbidden energy band as a toll gate where before you can pass through, there is a need to pay a certain amount. In the case of valence electrons, its energy must exceed a certain level first, typically 1 electron volt for semiconductors and 15 electron volts for insulators before it goes into the conduction band. What's interesting about semiconductors is that when a valence electron reaches the conduction band to become a free electron, it will leave a hole behind on the valence band. And these holes are associated with a positive charge. For now, remember that holes are positively charged and the free electron, being an electron, is negatively charged. We will be using this later. At absolute zero temperature, all valence electrons are on the valence band, resulting to no free electron in the conduction band. Thus, semiconductors act as insulators at this temperature. On the other hand, if a semiconductor is subjected to high temperatures, valence electrons become excited and gains enough energy to cross the band gap and become a free electron ready for conduction. Thus, at high temperatures, a semiconductor acts as a conductor. Therefore, a semiconductor can act as a conductor or an insulator depending on the temperature. Now that we have provided an evidence that the property of a semiconductor is between an insulator and a conductor, let us now discuss the types of semiconductors 